presentation of colors and remain standing for our national anthem. Retire the colors. <laughs> Friends, it's 
time has come. Crazy, we've been have some fun. Don't you know the words? Let the music play, play, play. Everybody sing. Please be seated. Sit back and enjoy the show. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome to um, Zoom Palestine. Aren't those guys great? Now, who would want to kill those fabulous sailors? Oh, Phil, you just missed the sailors singing uh, patriotic songs and then some really cool uh, music. Um, so I'll pick them up again later on. Uh, but Muhammad Mukminin is on Facebook. And somebody whose name in Arabic, I think I can figure out, but try and now while Abdul Hamda is on uh, Facebook. So uh, those sailors were so fabulous. Who would want to kill those guys? It's uh, really uh, a uh, shame when you read about the whole story. And actually putting this program together, I learned more stuff about what went on. So welcome, Phil. Uh, good to have you with us. Uh, and uh, um, if you'd be uh, kind enough to uh do, do you want to say hi anything yet or do you want to wait till later um i'm all ears i can wait okay great uh we have the chaplain from the uss liberty coming uh to be interviewed i don't know if he'll get on zoom but i will i have his phone he's in billings montana <laughs> so i'll be calling him if he doesn't get himself on facebook i'm glad you got on i was worried that there was some screw up anyhow so today we're going to be uh talking about the uh, um, the USS Liberty. And uh, uh, we're going to um, uh, discuss it from uh, a variety of, of points of view that uh, we may not be uh, fully aware of, of everything. So uh, just to give you uh, a little background uh, on it, I'm going to uh, show some pictures and then uh, read uh um read from the uh um let me see let me oh let me go back and get off the uh uh the um get off this uh, uh the the uh video i have on uh, uh see if i can yeah okay there we go yeah so uh oh, well first of all i wanted to play while we're waiting for a few more people to come on. Um, I have some very cool Palestinian uh, hip hop mute, uh, and it comes from this group called uh, DAM, uh, and they're a pioneering hip hop band, uh, DAM. They've been around since the early 2000s. They come from Lode, the original uh, you know, city uh, where the airport is now. Uh, and they rapped about poverty, racism, and discrimination faced by Palestinians. So we can listen to them while we're waiting for more people to come on. Um, and uh, they, uh, they talk about the discrimination faced by Palestinian citizens of Israel. So Phil, you may have heard about them while you were there. Um, and one of the songs here, I think is really the grace, who's the terrorist? I'm the terrorist. How could I be the terrorist when you've taken my land? I think. Uh, that whole uh, business of the narrative that the Palestinians, uh, the bad guys, of... and they are the, the uh, terrorists uh, is something that's uh, very problematic. Uh, and those of us who know the story about what's going on, we 
question uh, very much the uh, the narrative of uh, Palestinians as the uh, terrorists. So let's uh, um, share this with you. Uh, I think you'll find it Here's very interesting. Let me. Uh... All right. This is uh, starts out with uh, fifty years quote. of assault on Palestinian rights. I think they're the most terrorized, or at least with the Iraqi people, they're the most terrorized people on earth and have been for so many years. Practically every Palestinian lives in constant harassment, threat of violence, humiliation, and that way for a long, long time. Wasn't that great? I like this song because I can understand most of the Arabic, <laughs> but it's a really great, great song. Um, so uh, uh, we have a few more people on uh, Facebook Live, um, but uh, nobody else coming in on Zoom yet. I hope the uh, chaplain can get in on Zoom. But anyhow, what we're going to do now is uh, uh, give some basic background of the incident. Uh, I found this wonderful article um, by uh, um, James Banford from a book called Body of Secrets. And I'm going to uh, read it to you um, uh, while I show you some. Oh, oh, first of all, I wanted to mention breaking news uh, just came up. The Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is out from power as Israel's government uh, proved a precarious uh, coalition government led by Nef Nef Naftali Bennett. Well, of course, we don't know if this is going to be good for Palestinians or just, you know, a change of masters. Uh, and it says, Mr. Bennett, former aide to Mr. Nahu, opposes a Palestinian state, and Yar Lapid, 
who's set to take Bennett's place after two years will lead an eight party alliance that agrees on little, but a desire to oust Mr. Netanyahu, the longest serving leader in the country's history and to end, end Israel's lengthy political gridlock. Well, I doubt that uh, Israelis are gonna suddenly uh, unify about anything, uh, particularly their government. So uh, uh, probably next week, we'll be talking a little bit about the Palestinian reaction to it. And they're having that Flag Day march this week as well. So I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll see some more developments having to do with it. But uh, meanwhile, um, while I show you some images of the USS Liberty, um, I'm going to read you this really fascinating article uh, that um, just uh, blew my mind, to be honest. Uh, um, I, uh, uh, so here it goes. Um, it's um, uh, from his book called Body of Secrets. And this is a picture of the ship after the bombing. And uh, early on the morning of Thursday, June 8th, 1967, uh, before some of you who are watching were probably alive, the first rays of the sun spilled softly over the Sinai's blonde waves of sand. A little more than a dozen miles north in the choppy eastern sea, the USS Liberty headed eastward. But the calmness was like quicksand, deceptive, inviting, and friendly until it was too late. As the Liberty passed the desert town of El Arish, it was being closely watched. I'm going to adjust my camera so Facebook Live people have a better view. Um, about 4,000 feet above was an Israeli. Hi, welcome, Norby. About 4,000, you missed the great music from the Navy and from the Palestinians, but it'll be on the YouTube. Um, about 4,000 feet above was an Israeli reconnaissance aircraft. At 6.5 a.m., the observer on the plane reported back to Israel Naval Headquarters. What we could see were the letters written on that ship. And we gave these letters to ground control, he said. The letters, as you can see in the picture, were GTR5, the Liberty's identification. GTR stood for General Technical Research, which was a cover name for the National Security Agency's fleet of spy ships. And my cousin was, uh, uh, an intelligence officer on that ship. The Liberty was in dangerous waters at a dangerous time. The six day war in which Israeli air and ground forces launched a massive attack on Egypt, Syria and Jordan was raging. Fearing involvement in the Middle East war, the US Joint Chief of Staffs needed rapid intelligence on the ground situation in Israel. Ships were considered the best option for the job. They could sail relatively close and pick up the most important signals. Also, unlike aircraft, they could remain on station for weeks at a time, eavesdropping, locating transmitters and analyzing the intelligence. And so the Liberty, which was large, fast, and had been stationed relatively close on the Ivory Coast, West Africa, had been ordered in. Throughout the morning, the ship sailed on. Uh, and with, Renate, with reconnaissance repeated at approximately 30 minute intervals. At one point, an Israeli Air Force uh, uh, plane circled the ship and headed back toward the Sinai. Uh, one of the crew members said it had a big Star of David on it. It was flying just a little over our mass. I was actually able to wave to the co-pilot. He waved back and actually smiled at me. I could see him that well. There's no question about it. They had seen the ship's markings and the American flag. They could damn near see my rank. The underway flag was definitely flying, especially when you're close to a war zone. By 9.50 AM, the minaret at Al Arash could be seen with the naked eye, like a solitary mast in a sea of sand. Although no one on the ship knew it at the time, the Liberty had suddenly trespassed into a private horror. At that very moment near the minaret, Israeli forces were engaged in a criminal slaughter. Three days after Israel had launched the Six Day War, Egyptian prisoners in the Sinai 
had become a nuisance. There was no place to house them, not enough Israelis to watch them, and few vehicles to transport them to prison camps. But there was another way to deal with them. As the Liberty sat with an eye shot of El Arish, eavesdropping on surrounding communications, Israeli soldiers turned the town into a slaughterhouse, systematically butchering their prisoners. An eyewitness recounted how in the shadow of the El Arish Mosque, they lined up about 60 unarmed Egyptian prisoners, hands tied behind their backs, and then opened fire with machine guns until the pale desert sand turned red. This and other war crimes were just some of the secrets Israel had sought to conceal since the start of the conflict. An essential element in the Israeli battle plan seemed to have been to hide much of the war behind a carefully constructed curtain of lies. Lies about the Egyptian threat. Lies about who started the war. Lies to the US president. Lies to the UN Security Council. Lies to the press, lies to the public. Thus, as American naval historian Richard K. Smith noted, any instrument which sought to penetrate this smoke screen so carefully thrown around the normal, quote, fog of war would have to be frustrated. Yet into this sea of deception and slaughter sailed the USS Liberty, an enormous spy factory with the latest eavesdropping gear. About noon, as the Liberty was again in sight of El Arish while the massacres were taking place, an army commander there reported that a ship was shelling them from the sea, but that was impossible. The only ship in the vicinity was the Liberty and she was eavesdropping, not shooting. As any observer would have recognized, the ship was a tired old Second World War II vessel crawling with antennae and unthreatening to anyone unless it was their secrets, not their lives they wanted to protect. By then the Israeli Navy and Air Force had conducted more than six hours of close surveillance of the Liberty off the Sinai and must have positively identified it as an American electronic spy ship. They knew she was the only military ship in the area. Nevertheless, the order was given to kill her. And at 12.05 PM, three motor torpedo rockets from boats from the port of Ashad, about 50 miles away, departed. Israeli Air Force fighters loaded with 50 millimeter cannon ammunition rockets and napalm, napalm followed. Without warning, the Israeli Jeff's sweat wing uh, Dassault Mirage 3 Cs struck. On board Liberty, Lieutenant Painter observed that the aircraft had absolutely no markings, their identity unclear. He then attempted to reach the van manning the gun mounts, but it was too late. I was trying to contact those two kids, he recalled, and I saw them both. Well, I didn't actually see them as much. They were blown apart but I saw the whole um, aircraft uh, strafe the bridge area. Um, and uh, we went up into smoke and scattered metal. Uh, the quartermaster petty officer of third class Pollard was standing next to me and he was hit. The Mirage raked the ship from bow to stern with armor piercing lead. A bomb exploded near the whaleboat after the bridge and those in the pilot house and the bridge were thrown from their fleet. Commander William McGonagall grabbed the engine order annunciator and rang up full flank ahead. In the communication spaces, oh, Juan is here, wonderful, great. And my cousin is here, Robert Casal, wonderful. Oh, how great. You guys are here. Hi, Patty, thanks. Fabulous, okay. I'm, I'm in the to listen to this now. Okay. Um, yeah, I do. I have my suit tie on. I'm sitting here in my, in my drawers. Okay, just me. <laughs> okay, thanks. I love you. I love you too. Bye. Alman uh, shouted, uh, yeah. We are under attack by unidentified jet aircraft and require immediate assistance. Hey, wonderful. She's burning, said an Israeli pilot. Don't mind the aircraft. 
of carrying us as Saratoga, operating near Crete, acknowledged Liberty's cry for help. I am standing by for further traffic signal. Um, can everybody mute themselves, please? After taking out the gun mounts, the Israeli fighter pilots turned their attention to the antennae. So the ship could not call for help. Interceptions, which is a violation killing instantly the ship's executive officer. Mute everybody. Okay. All right. I'm going to mute everybody for now. Okay. Um, so they then they attacked the antennae, so they couldn't call for help. Then the planes attacked the bridge, killing instantly the ship's executive officer. With the Liberty now deaf, blind, and silenced, unable to call for help or move, the Israeli pilots proceeded to kill her. Designed to punch holes in the toughest tanks, their shells tore through the uh, uh, Liberty, uh, Liberty steel plating like hot nails through butter, exploding into jagged bits of shrapnel and butchering men deep in their living quarters. Remember, this was an old World War II ship. As the slaughter continued, neither the Israelis nor the Liberty crew had any idea that witnesses were present high above. That is until now we know. According to information recently obtained, for nearly 35 years, the NSA has hidden the fact, and this is mind blowing, that one of its planes, a Navy EC-121 ferret, was overhead at the time of the incident, eavesdropping on what was going on below. The interceptions from that plane, which answers some of the key questions about the attack, are among the NSA's deepest secrets. The ferret had taken off from Athens for its regular patrol of Eastern Mediterranean about the time that the air attack was getting underway. The Navy chief petty officer heard one of the other Hebrew linguists on the plane excitedly trying to get his attention on the secure intercom. Hey, chief, he shouted. I've got really odd activity. This is in Hebrew on the UHF. They mentioned an American flag. I don't know what's going on. Nowiki asked the linguist for the frequency and rolled up to it. Sure as the devil, said Nowiki, Israeli aircraft were completing an attack on some object. I alerted the evaluator, giving him spare details, adding that we had no idea what was taking place. Deep down in the Liberty, Terry McFarlane, head encased in the earphones, was vaguely aware of flickers of light coming through the bulkhead. He had no idea that they were armor-piercing tracer bullets slicing through the ship's skin. Larry Weaver had run to his general headquarters station, but it was located on an old helicopter pad that left him exposed and vulnerable. He grabbed a day shipmate and pushed him into a safe corner. I said, Fred, stay here. You've just got to because he's coming up the center. Weaver recalled, I got into a fetal position and before I looked up, I saw the American flag and that's the last thing I saw before I was hit. I closed my eyes. I was hit by a rocket and cannon fire blew two and a half feet of my colon and I received over a hundred shrapnel wounds. It blew me up into the air about four and a half feet, blood everywhere. And I turned around torn and mutilated bodies everywhere. He said, horrible sight. As soon as the mirage was pulled away, they were replaced by super mystere fighters, which raked the ship. Again, a later analysis show 821 separate hits on the hull and superstructure. Now, in addition to rocket cannon and machine gun fire, the Mysteres attacked with 1,000 pound bombs and napalm. And uh, Chaplain Ron is gonna talk to us about why he thinks it's a miracle that any of them survived. We'll hear him after this. Um, deafening explosions tore through the ship and the bridge disappeared in orange and black ball. Lying wounded by shrapnel, his blood draining into his shoe was Commander McGonagall. Seconds later, the fighters were back flesh fused with iron as more strafing was followed by more rockets, more napalm. 
As the last fighter departed, having emptied out its onboard armory, turning the Liberty Tall into a flaming mash of grace was cheese. Sailors left mutilate, mutilated shipmates on to make makeshift stretches of pipe frame and chicken wire. Damage uh, control crews pushed through the passageways of suffocating smoke and blistering heat, and Chief Petty Officer's Lounge was converted into a macabre sea of blood-soaked mattresses and shattered bodies. After landing back at the Athens airport, the wiki and the intercept crew were brought directly to the proceeding center. By the time we arrived at the USA 51J compound, he said, radical reports are coming in to the station about the attack on the USS Liberty. The NSA civilians took our tapes and began transcribing. It's pretty clear that Israeli Air Force aircraft and motor, motor torpedo boats attacked a ship in the East Med. Although the attackers never gave a name or a whole number, the ship was identified as flying an American flag. We concluded the ship was the USS Liberty. 50 minutes after the first shells tore to the ship, the attack was still going on. And the aircraft carrier USS America cruising near Crete was ordered to launch four armed A-4 Skyhawks. At the same time, the carrier USS Sarasota was also told to send four armed A-1 attack planes to defend the ship. Sending aircraft to cover you, they were told. Surface units on their way. But at that moment in Washington, President Johnson was at his desk on the phone, alternately shouting at congressional leaders and coaxing them to support his position on several pieces of legislation. Four minutes later, he was interrupted. The Liberty has been torpedoed in the Mediterranean, Rostow told Johnson. The NSA's worst fears have come true. After considerations of personal safety, said the deputy director to tell her, one of my immediate concerns, considering the depth of the water and distance of the ship offshore, had to do with classified materials on board. He got on the phone to talk to um, the uh, uh, joint um, the Navy director uh, that all the written material be burned if all possible and the electronic equipment is salvaged. But Totello was not prepared for what he heard. According to NSA documents, top secret, he was told that some senior officials in Washington wanted above all to protect Israel from embarrassment. Captain Vineyard mentioned this during his conversation. The consideration was then being given by some unnamed Washington authorities to sink the liberty in order that newspaper men would be unable to photograph her and thus inflame public opinion about against the Israelis. Um, a cover story for Liberty was then devised, sent out uh, that she was a communications research ship uh, that was diverted from her research assignment to provide it in communication, relay links with embassies around the Mediterranean. But on the Liberty, black smoke was still escaping through the more than 800 holes in the hull. And the effort to hush up the incident had already begun. Within hours of the attack, which left 34 men dead and two thirds of the rest of the crew wounded, Israel asked President Johnson to quietly bury the incident. Uh, Embassy Tel Aviv said a highly secret, very limited distribution message to State Department, urging de-emphasis on publicity, since the proximity of the vessel to the scene of conflict was fuel for Arab suspicions that the US was aiding Israel. Shortly thereafter, a total news ban was ordered by the Pentagon. No one was able to say anything about the attack. Uh, and it was a total cover up, uh, which we're going to see more about. There was never a congressional investigation. Uh, and the, uh, the um, veterans who were, uh, of course, uh, outraged about everything um, formed a the group which um, then they, uh, uh, and I'll show you their uh, website. Let me see if I can get onto their website, hold on. Um, the uh, Veterans, USS Liberty Veterans Association website. Um, share that image with you in a minute. Um, because the men on the ship knew that what had happened and were horrified uh, that there was never any uh, 
investigation. And worse, that the, uh, the planes that were sent <coughs> to help them were turned back. Um, and uh, on their website of the uh, USS Liberty Veterans Association, they have a lot of very interesting information. And they point out that the Sixth Fleet abandoned them uh, and the plane sent for them. Uh, and they list uh, the war crimes that were involved in this, um, which included, uh, besides the, the attack, I mean, these were committed during the attack, jamming their radios, war crime, use of unmarked aircraft to attack war crime, deliberate machine gunning of life rafts. They had dropped over the side uh, to um, abandon, in case they had to abandon ship. And the recall of two flights of rescue aircraft that had been launched from a six fleet aircraft carrier. So um, we have a um, horrific situation that still to this date has not been addressed by uh, Congress. So what I'm going to ask is um, for uh, uh, Chaplain Ron to uh, come on and join us. Can you uh, unmute your, let me see, can you unmute yourself, Ron? Um, you just have to uh, hit, in the lower part of the screen where it says mute, if you could hit it. So you can, because I muted you there, thank you. So let me introduce you uh, to everybody. Um, this is Chaplain uh, Ron Kukal uh, from Nebraska, uh, originally a little town called Rushville. And he told me before the meeting, he joined the Navy when he was 18 and was uh, promoted uh, and was up to, was ready to take the test for chief petty officer at the time of the attack. Uh, after eight years of service, he loved the Navy, but his career was interrupted by the attack. Um, he ended up having to start his own business. Uh, he had to leave, became a licensed electrician, but he was diagnosed with PTSD, which uh, most of the uh, gentlemen on the ship endured and suffered uh, after he was discharged and also with a lower back injury. Um, but he was able to work enough, but he's now retired after contracting and working for the VA. And he was assigned uh, as the supervisor of specialized communications aboard the ship. And he was situated about 60 feet from the torpedo when it exploded during the attack. Thus his belief that divine intervention kept that ship afloat and the, the, the survivors uh, alive um, and save the ship because it really should have sunk. So um, Chaplain Ron, welcome to Zoom Palestine. And would you share with us uh, your experience of, of that day when it happened? Well, thank you for having me. Um, uh, is Bob on here too, Bob Cassell? He is, yeah, yeah. Okay, all righty, I haven't talked to him in years. Um, first of all, um, there's never been any ulterior motive for uh, what the uh, USS Liberty survivors have been doing. There's been none whatsoever. The bottom line has always been a congressional investigation, which we should have had and never got. I'd like to make that uh, very clear before I start, because uh, let's see. I've been at this uh, professor for um, about 54 years now, and uh, I never have gotten used to the name column that comes in when you go on to some programs. It has, has happened to me a few times, and a few threats on top of that. I'd like to make that very clear. Um, also, uh, as a prerequisite, uh, what I want to say, um, and I'm not uh, trying to belittle anybody, but three fourths of the crew on the USS Liberty were uh, had a uh, top secret clearance. And I just wanted to make it clear to the audience, there were how many's listening, that uh, that top secret clearance was not given just to just anybody. They checked back into our uh, the FBI, checked back into our background for about uh, two to three generations. Matter of fact, I think they told me where my grandmother lived in Prague. So uh, they were they were pretty good about checking your background. You weren't allowed. So you, to men were, you men were then of, of highly credible 
uh, people of, of considered to be highly credible and of great value, right? He caught that, thank you very much. Uh, yes, and uh, what we what I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows is that I don't know how it would be possible for these men to get together after the attack and become a bunch of racist, I guess you could call them, uh, whatever you would call it, and are just shooting uh, arrows into the wind to um, try to get a story across. It's just simply not true. And we can back this up. I like to say things I know that I can back up. And uh, <clears throat> believe me, I've been at this for 54 years. And uh, uh, well, Bob knows that quite well. I even remember uh, his Liberty, uh, Liberty uh, plumbing and heating outfit in Rochester, New York. So um, on June 8th, 1967, I was not topside. Usually I do my interviews with Bill Turney right now, unless we surprised him. He's sitting at a restaurant right now in Cedar Ridge, Colorado, because I just called him. And if we did call him, it would probably surprise the heck out of him. But the reason I like to have him on with me is because he was topside that morning. Um, he saw a lot more than I did. So what I'm, what I would tell you right now would not be uh, uh, eyewitness. It would be, I guess you could call hearsay. But uh, none of these guys that I know of is gonna, ever going <laughs> to tell me a lie about any of this. When I first woke up that, uh, when I woke up that, that morning, I went to the uh, shower and uh, took care of all my needs before I went to breakfast. And uh, there were some of my men were running around telling me that uh, we were being circled by uh, Israeli aircraft. Uh, they were marked, they were marked aircraft. And uh, uh, they were so friendly that I think a couple of guys topside even waved at the pilots as they went by and they went back. So, um, and how long they circled, I can't say, because uh, that's why I like to have Bill Turney on here with me. But it was quite a length of time that morning, and uh, it was enough to, to realize that uh, we were flying the flag. It never did hang limp at the, at the mast. And if people would check the weather back during that day, they'll find out there's about uh, 12 knot wind. We were running around three to five knots ourselves, so there was enough to unfurl the flag. It was never hanging limp at the mast, not one time. And uh, well, anyway, getting back to uh, what I, when I, uh, the day, um, I went to breakfast and uh, I told all the men that worked in my department that, hey, don't worry about this. Uh, we'll be encircled by. Israeli aircraft, they're friendly, uh, they're not going to do nothing, and uh, so don't let this kind of thing bother you. And so after breakfast, uh, we did, we went to work, all the guys, and uh, I, I went topside that morning about, I think it was around 11.30, and uh, I did observe a couple of, um, well, I think they called flying boxcars back then, I'm not a Air Force type guy, but I think they were like a C-135, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what they were doing up there, but I know we were agreeing there was plenty of surveillance from the air that day. And uh, I did observe one of them myself. Went to I went to Chow, and um, after Chow at 1300. Uh, which is uh, 1 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, military time, um, we were supposed to have a general quarters drill, and we well, did. Let me ask you a question. When you observed the, the planes observing you, were the planes marked? Did you know? It's hard to tell from, from my standpoint, simply because they were up there so high. It was okay. hard to tell. They were just up too high, and uh, as I said, uh, after afterwards, we've we've known that we were there was plenty of surveillance uh, from the air, and it wasn't just. Uh, I'm not going to get into that because I really don't know uh, what I should know about it. I just know there were people afterwards that uh, heard our distress calls and stuff like that. But um, I don't know if you're held to an hour on this or not. Are you? No, 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 no. We'll go over because we're going to look at the video also. It was an hour, so we'll be. Okay. 
will be over, so don't worry about it. Oh, okay, okay. So um, the uh, general quarters drill um, went quite well. The captain uh, was very happy with the way that it went. And uh, my general sport quarter station was um, up top side and of our, and I think pretty close to what they call the flying bridge. So it's pretty, pretty high up there. And so I left that and I went back to my workstation and I had no sooner, sooner sit down. Uh, I heard a sound overhead. So now remember, I'm, I'm two decks down below the main deck. And uh, I'd have to estimate, but I suppose it may be that uh, that sound came from maybe 20 foot over my head, somewhere in that area that I didn't uh, recognize. And being an old farm boy from um, Nebraska, originally from Nebraska, um, we had a lot of hail out there. And I can certainly remember what uh, when you hear hail hitting a tin roof, it makes quite a noise. <clears throat> kind of what it sounded like to me. Still, I didn't recognize it for what it was. Well, what it was, it was uh, nine of my shipmates were being uh, killed topside on the main deck uh, by the French Mirage jets that had started scraping the ship. Wow. And uh, from down below, from where I was, I heard the sound of the strafing, didn't know what it was. I used every excuse I could think of because I just did not know what it was. I thought we'd run aground, all kinds of stuff just made, didn't make any sense. But uh, later on in the attack, uh, I think the attack on the, by the aircraft lasted I don't know, maybe 45 minutes. And uh, they strafed us several times and they did kill nine, nine men topside. The next thing I heard that came over the ship's uh, 1MC, which is the ship's intercom, came from the captain. And his message was simply this, um, prepare, prepare for a torpedo attack. Wow. Well, all of our watertight doors were all pretty close to which was which needed to be done. And everything that was needed to uh, be done before uh, any type of attack was, was taken care of. And so um, here's what I did. Uh, still amazed uh, at what was going on around me and thinking to myself, uh, this kind of stuff only happens in the movies. And here it is happening to me and others, of course. And uh, I went to prayer because I was actually praying for my life. I wanted to be spared. And uh, I spent about 10 or 15 minutes maybe there promising a lot of things to the good Lord that uh, I knew it would never happen because I wouldn't be able to accomplish them. But you know what it's like? When you're asking for your life, I guess you just say about anything. I want, but I walked back to my desk after the uh, prayer, and uh, here's what happened. And uh, please don't anybody call for a straitjacket because I'm telling you what happened. I heard a voice. I don't know if anybody else heard it. And that voice said simply this get down and get down now. Well, I was standing at my desk and uh, was so uh, horrified, I guess. I know I didn't move to the deck. I know I didn't put myself on the deck. I know I was put on the deck with my nose to the steel plating, flat down, about five seconds, maybe 10 seconds before the torpedo exploded. This is the amazing thing about this, and I consider it a miracle. I consider it divine intervention that uh, standing in my desk and being put flat on the deck without even knowing how it got there five to 10 seconds before the torpedo exploded. Um, well, I'll just leave it up to the other people that happen to be listening, what they might think it was. But the torpedo exploded. I heard the shrapnel flying through the air over my head, killing everybody in the compartment where I was at. Practically everyone died that day. And uh, there was a couple that escaped too, but not very many of them. Uh, maybe two, maybe three, I don't know. So anyway, um, the compartment 
filled instantly with water. I was wading in water about up to my shoulder, uh, going towards the uh, ladder that would lead to the deck up above, which I hoped would be dry, and it was. And uh, there was a lot of men all trying to get up that ladder at the same time. And uh, uh, I don't know, remember what happened about how I got there. I got there fairly quickly. And uh, the hatch was closed, but if you will, uh, a hatch is made in a particular way that there's a small hole, and I, should, I couldn't, shouldn't call it small, but there's a hole in the middle of the hatch called a scuttle. That can be opened up without opening up the whole hatch and a body can pass through that hole, it's big enough. Um, so as I reached the top of the ladder, a uh, hand came down through that hole and grabbed me and pulled me straight up. I don't know who it was. Whoever it was had to be pretty strong, um, very, very strong to lift a body straight up out of the water down there below and uh, pull them through that hole. I got through the hole and uh, headed towards the um, main deck. Um, it was dry up there, but I still wanted to get up to the main deck. So I headed to the main deck. Uh, I didn't quite get outside uh, outside the hatch before Lieutenant George Golden stopped me and told me, ordered me to turn around and go back down below and make sure that uh, everybody had gotten out. So I wasn't too excited about following that order, but I knew that I better. So I did. I went back down below. By the time I got there, the hatch was wide open. I could hear the water sloshing down below, and I, I called out several times, um, several times, and uh, there was no answer. So I went back topside, sliding all over the place because the passageway was full of blood and water everywhere you went, and reported to Lieutenant Golden, who was trying to start the emergency generators, that uh, I couldn't uh, raise anybody down there. There was nobody hollered back when I hollered in uh, down below. And uh, so he let me go on outside. And as I went outside, all my shipmates were out there. The guys that had gotten out from down below are still alive. Because there was, there was other compartments uh, close to the torpedo. A lot of those guys in other compartments did get out. Uh, there's no doubt about that. They did. And they were all out there slapping each other on the back and shaking each other's hands and just uh, really happy to still be alive. Well, years later, Phil Turney, who has become a very good friend of mine, called me and said, Ron, do you know what I observed when you guys were out there shaking each other's hands and slapping each other on the back? Do you know what I saw? And I said, no. I said, you saw a bunch of guys happy to be alive. He said, you guys are out there slapping each other on the back, happy as you could be, and they were still firing at the ship. 50 caliber machine guns, still firing the ship. Those bolts were flying all over the place. And you guys act like there weren't nothing, nothing going on. I said, well, I'm sure that's probably true because uh, we were so excited about being alive that I suppose we ignored everything going on around us. And uh, that's just something I'd throw in as a sidelight there and uh, something that uh, someone might ponder a little bit to why would these people, why would these men not be getting down to, uh, you know, not be hit by, or to not get hit by this uh, machine gun fire? So uh, anyway, as um, the day transpired and uh, they finally left, we were still pretty all upset about the fact that we had a torpedo, they fired five torpedoes at us. Uh, they hit us with one. And I might observe right now for everybody that the torpedo hole, and still to tell on you the footage that they made, because I don't exactly remember it, you could have drove a semi truck through it. That's how big the hole was. The professionals who looked at that hole when we were in dry dock in Malta. Uh, said one thing, and I remember it more, it came from everyone. They could not uh, figure out how um, the ships didn't float. And uh, 
and I know how it stayed afloat. I know that God saved us on that day. I, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. It was divine intervention. And those people that attacked us, I don't care what they hit us with, that it would not have went to the bottom, and it didn't go to the bottom. The following morning after the attack, the USS David come off along, gave us come off alongside, and uh, they were transported over, and they went down below with some of the uh, Liberty crewmen and shored up the bulging bulkheads because we were about ready to sink. I don't know how many bulkheads would have had to go after that uh, hole was uh, cut the torpedo hole, but they were all bulging and they were close to going uh, to um, just giving way and uh, the ship going to the bottom. Those men, without a doubt, some of the greatest heroes I think I've ever met in my life. And I want to say this because I respect every last one of them. To go down below, lock yourself in, shore up the bulkheads so we didn't go to the bottom took a lot of courage. These guys did it. And I'm so very proud. Uh, they should have been the most highly decorated men in the whole United States Navy. All of them. Did they get any any rec any medals of honor or anything for doing this? Well, yes, we all got our medals uh, and ribbons and what have you. Um, it took a while because that's also they, not done in the usual way. It was done in private ceremonies, uh, so that most people didn't know about it. Oh, probably yeah. Um, Actually, uh, the, the thing about it is, is after this is all over with, and I, I kind of went this through this fairly fast, uh, Professor, uh, but only because I thought my time was limited, and um, sorry about that. But uh, after this is all over with, yes, we fought for 54 years. In the beginning, you could hardly mention it. Uh, you could be called names, you'd be called anti-Semitic, you could be called just about anything. And it was tough to go through things like that. And I know a lot of guys did. I went through it myself. I went through some um, situations that I think could have been considered threats. Um, we were told at one reunion by a man that was unknown to me that what we were doing was hazardous to our health. Uh, Phil Turney, more specifically, has had his life threatened. Uh, I think he got in a real confrontation out in Los Angeles one time over a, um, a radio program he was doing or TV. I can't remember which. So yes, it's been a tough, it's been a tough road to hold for 54 years. However, I do see a few things that I've never, I never saw in the beginning, and I do believe that more people are very much aware of what really went on here as opposed to what the government would like you to believe. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot more people than there ever was before. And uh, as I said, um, I've been in it for a long time and I've seen it go from literally nothing to what it is today. Liberty Veterans Association is quite well known now. They are, uh, they're going to be here for a while. They're planning to keep that organization going even after we're gone, because we all feel that, um, not, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but I'm sure they would say I'm correct when they would say that we've all stood for the truth and we've been called everything but what we are. And I've done, I don't know how many testimonials. The, the best one I've ever did was at uh, Liberty Fellowship in Kalispell, Montana. Uh, Pastor Chuck Baldwin um, had me just turned the mic over to me and I told pretty much the same stories I told today. It was live streamed around the world. So I know that a lot of people got it. And there has been so many other crewmen and that even include, and that includes Bob. I know Bob wasn't on the ship, but he, I know that he has done a plenty of talking about this. And I think, in my own personal opinion, that we have accomplished enough to 
get their attention. I really do. So, um, well, what I understand, uh, President Johnson was threatened uh, very seriously, uh, and he was getting ready to run for re-election, and uh, he had some very nasty threats um, thrown at him, and that was, you know, uh, the first of many uh, thrown at politicians. Uh, I agree with you, Ron, that the, the, the tie seems to be turning, uh, maybe now with the new Israeli government, we might have a hope of uh, something, but I don't know. You know, it's uh, um, it's still a very touchy issue, uh, um, and uh, I, it, but but I I believe in a way it's uh, uh, an ethical, moral, spiritual issue. You know, right is right and wrong is wrong, and uh, uh, what happened to you guys is violation of Jewish law, Jewish ethics. Uh, comedies uh, during recently, and uh, he would not be at all happy <laughs> with what the Israeli government has yeah. been doing uh, because it violates Jewish ethical principles. And I think that uh, the conflation of, of criticism of Israel into being anti Semitic uh, is a, a real disgrace because Judaism has always stood for high standard of ethical values, and Israel unfortunately has been violating them. Uh, um, and, uh, but, you know, I hope you're right that, that the tide is changing. I'm, I'm hoping it is too. Well, the thing is, I guess the bottom line with me as a chaplain for the Liberty Veterans Association uh, comes kind of um, in so many ways spiritually, but uh, President uh, Coolidge many, many years ago said this publicly, and I, I think I can almost quote it word for word, that nation that forgets its defenders will be will be forgotten itself or will be itself forgotten. Uh, that's how he put it. And if this nation insists on turning their back on their own people that have done everything to defend this country and, and paid with their lives. That's right. That's right. I think there's a natural law. Yeah. It's a law of any law you'll find in this country, in the whole world. Yeah. It's a natural law, and there's some things you cannot do, right. or you're gonna. This nation is gonna come under judgment if they're not already. Absolutely. And so, if we're not seeing it, I don't know. <laughs> you just all you can do is look around you. Yeah. Things are not so good. So, uh, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> agree. Thank you. Uh, 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 cousin Robert, cousin Bob, uh, can you unmute yourself? I'd like to ask you a couple questions uh, since you're so general, and I love the painting behind you. By the way, narrative that says, "Well, um, unmute yourself." Might um, be just, yeah, but before uh, uh, Sal, if you go to the lower left hand part, screen, there's a thing that says, the "Arab armies invaded Palestine." Uh, when the Arab armies invaded Palestine, there was a war. All right. Now, what is he asking a question? Over the world, so it was the war. Responsible for the Brody, are you asking a question? You and let's listen to uh, Robert. Robert, um, you were not, you were lucky to not be on the ship that day, but you know, these were all of your colleagues, your, your, your people you were close to. The guy who replaced you, I understood, was killed, you know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what uh, were you asked to uh, take that vow of silence to uh, afterwards, as well as the guys who were on the ship? No, I wasn't. I wasn't part of the uh, so, um, I was never asked to do anything because nobody uh, knew where I was. Good, good. So, um, your sound is not that great. I'm not sure why, but anyhow, we can still hear you. So, what? What's your take on what Ron is saying? Do you agree with him that things are getting better, uh, that people will eventually come and acknowledge this, uh, what, the, the slaughter of Americans? What do you think? It's sad that Congress never investigated this. Uh, Robert, we can't hear you too well. Um, 
if you think, can you uh, check your uh, audio a little bit? Because you're going in and out. I've had this problem before. I haven't had to change it, so. Yeah, okay. Let's try. Okay, Robert, can you want to try to talk now? Yes, can you hear me any better? That's better. Yeah, that was better. Yeah. All right. They were going to the Middle East. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, he said if you couldn't hear him that the U that the ship was originally off the coast of Africa and they had no idea they were going to end up in the Middle East. Yes, they went to the road to Spain and what they did is they um they brought on stores. Oh, so that that they were they went to Spain, and they they told the Spanish and Portuguese guys to leave the ship. Yes, and what they what they did is they brought on uh, Israeli and Arab linguists because they were, now they were being diverted to the Middle East, but they had no idea why they were going there. Okay, so they knew they were going to the Middle East, but they didn't know why. Yes, and. and seven days to get there. When they got there, they were immediately spotted by an Israeli aircraft. Yes, and the Israeli um, duty officer uh, went to Jane's fighting ships and he found the Liberty in Jane's fighting ships and he put a marker on the Israeli war board that this was the USS Liberty and it was a neutral ship, an ally. So the Israelis made a record that it was a USS ship. So they knew it was Oh, yes, they knew, and they put the marker on the war board. And then between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m. in the afternoon, they overflew the ship at least 13 times to make a, a positive identification of the ship. Ah, so they overflew, they flew over the ship 13 times. Uh, <laughs> so they knew damn well what was there. Oh, they were they were quite aware of what, what the ship was. Um they, they, one time they flew so close to the ship that the ship vibrated. And we think that, we think that the box car that, that was overflying the ship was taking pictures of the ship to try to identify this new thing that was on the aft part of the ship. And that was our, what we called our Triscom system. Your what system? It was called Triscom. It was a satellite that could go hook up to the moon and make direct communications with the National Security Agency. Wow. Okay, so this is really interesting. They flew so close uh, that they uh, vibrated the ship because they were taking pictures of this new satellite equipment uh, yes. that could actually send signals up to the moon and back to NSA. And the, the problem is that the Israelis had no idea because the last photo they had of the ship was something that was in Jane's fighting ships. So here's this new piece of equipment on the aft part of the ship. What they had to do is they had to investigate. So they went to their intelligence agency and, and said, can you identify this piece of equipment? What does it do? So they, they photographed this equipment and then, but they didn't know what it was because it was new. So they 
said to the spy agencies to ask them what it was. Yes, yes, and um, I, I'm not sure what uh, you know, what, what had come back because um, all of a sudden, you know, it, well, I told you in the afternoon they they called general quarters about one o'clock or one p.m. local time, and then at two p.m. the attack began. So they uh, called back general headquarters around one and two o'clock. They attacked again. So they actually they knew exactly what they were doing. Oh, they had they had they knew they knew what they were doing. We even had reports from one of one of the pilots radioing back to tell me that this is an American ship. I could see the flag flying, and this pilot was told to return to base. Yeah, so they, they uh, saw the flag flying, the pilots reported it. Um, it's just unbelievable, unbelievable. So what, what happened with the information? Uh, Bob, what, why, you know, how much of it was given to the public and how much of it was uh, concealed? When the ship was flying, mm. Everybody was told to shut up, basically. Yeah, I think Ron said that in the beginning, that, you know, when these guys are told, uh, don't, don't say anything. I, 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 you know, Ron had mentioned that, you know, after the torpedo attack, you didn't know who was in the, um, in, in the different space. Yes, I know that all that were in, in the, uh, the one space were killed. The only one that survived was Joel and Penny. Um, my space, I, my space was right next door. That was the coordination space. And when I, I left the ship, uh, Ron Campbell took my position, and, and Ron Campbell died in the attack. I know that um, survivors in that space, one was Dave Lewis, the other was uh, Jeff Carpenter, and um, there was one other. Oh, it was Sarge. This was, this was the, the, the wonderful the Marine, uh, Bryce Lockwood. And Bryce Lockwood, he survived. And he, he, along with Ron, was trying to get out of the space. Okay, we lost it, losing you again. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know what, what I um, wonder, uh, did, did the survivors get any reparations or anything for, from from Israeli government? Ron, Ron, do you know if, uh, uh, can you unmute yourself? Do you know if there was reparations paid to the, uh, the guys who survived, but, you know, were injured and went through PTSD? Some guys uh, <clears throat> received payment for their, uh, the clothes that they lost or the personal possessions that they lost. That's all they got out of it. Um, most of the money went for the payment of the ship to, uh, uh, you know, whatever they had to, it took to uh, repair the ship. Um, my myself, I can personally say, I did receive um, several thousand dollars, but it's only because I never stopped pounding the State Department. Um, to, uh, and then I also worked for the VA Medical Center, and I was... Uh, given a 10% disability, can you believe it? Um, 
for post-traumatic stress disorder and a low back uh, injury. And um, so they used that 10% and it gave me uh, several thousand dollars, which is a lot more than most of them got. And um, I couldn't consider myself very fortunate. So no, I don't think uh, they came close to even the reparations were, were even close to what needed to be done. Of course, you have to remember back then that post-traumatic stress disorder was not even a part of the uh, diagnostic manual that the doctors used. It was, it was only called a certain name. <clears throat> it was not recognized by the VA other than uh, uh, combat, fatigue, uh, stuff like that. So myself, uh, I went to the VA Medical Center in Hot Springs, South Dakota. I was diagnosed, but not with that. It was some kind of a psychiatric term. I believe it was called the psychoneurosis, something to that effect. Well, that was changed to PTSD when the, when the VA uh, recognized PTSD for what it was. When uh, second, did they finally change, start to uh, recognize PTSD? When did that change happen with the VA? You know, I don't, I, I thought you might ask that. And I really don't, I really can't put my finger on the, on the uh, year that happened. All I can tell you is that it did happen. And I can also tell you that uh, uh, when it did happen, the VA changed mine almost immediately. And the uh, problem is, is that uh, all these men, uh, <laughs> probably every one of them, uh, suffered uh, from post-traumatic stress disorder in one way, shape, or form. And because it wasn't recognized, uh, there was no way they could even, you know, ask for any reparations of any kind because it just wasn't recognized. Yeah. Well, it's a crazy it. thing. <laughs> I know. Well, the government, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Robert, how uh, did the other guys in the Navy, I mean, you weren't on the ship, but there were other sailors, other people in the Navy. Did you feel a um, sense of sympathy and, and concern by guys who were in the Navy but not on the ship? Were they upset about what happened? Anyone in the military knew about the liberty. They were upset. They were upset. Every people in the military were upset. Yeah. Can't, can't hear you. Work on your sound. Yeah. Jeff Carpenter, who survived, he was a little bit. Jeff Carpenter was, it was, uh, that's something. He was one of the survivors. He wanted, I, I wanted to go into Scary Island in California. That's where I met with Jeff. Jeff was, Jeff was sent to, to, to California. And I was told, and I'm not sure if this is true, that no two people that were on the river, mm -hmm. the one who passed, to the same. Could you say that again? You were told that anybody that was part of the impact, I didn't hear the whole thing uh, about, I know, but you, you said no two people, but I didn't hear the whole thing. Yes. No two people were transferred off the liberty to the same facility. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're really having trouble hearing you, um, which is really a shame. You know, maybe we can do this again where, um, you know, we can have more time and your um, um, audio will be a little better. I know my internet is not all that stable right now. So, uh, um, and it's um, you know, after four o'clock and I, I wanted to show the documentary uh, Dead in the Water uh, recommended by Robert, which I'd already seen myself. So. Uh, what I, I want to thank Ron and I thank um, my cousin Robert Bob Casale uh, for uh, 
sharing their experiences with us today. Uh, um, and I, I think, uh, Ron, one of the reasons that God kept you alive is, is because of today, is because you have to be a witness. You know, uh, witness is a very important in a prophetic way. Um, you know, that uh, uh, the witness is, is uh, extremely important. Robert, your experience um, uh, with the intelligence and, and sharing with us uh, the details about the, uh, the ship equipment was very interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that. So thank you for sharing. So you're a super spy. <laughs> um, so I'm very proud of you, uh, of your service and your brain. You got to be super smart to do all that stuff that you did. Uh, so I'm very proud of you because and very grateful to you for uh, sharing your experience. Uh, that voice, you know, who knows whose voice that was? Uh, that was definitely, a, 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 you know, a voice from God, <laughs> you know, whoever, whatever was used um, to get you in a safe position to keep you alive. So uh, we're very grateful to that voice because that's why you're here with us today. So blessings on you, Ron, and thank you for sharing. And and uh, cousin Cassell, thank you for sharing. And so now what I'm going to do is uh, play the um, vi video, the documentary, and we're over our time, but it goes about an hour. So if you want to Wonderful. Wonderful. I could say hello to Robert. Yes. Hello, Ron. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm hanging in there as best I can. I didn't hardly hear a thing you said because it's absolutely, um, it was just a garbled mess. I'm not sure why. Um, it's all right. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay, but uh, just want to tell you howdy. Howdy to you. <laughs> I love, I love to all I guess you'd have to repeat what he's saying, Professor. I just don't get it. I can't hear it. This is how we back. Uh, you guys, you know, I can share your the emails, the two of you, uh, send you each other's your email, and you can connect. Um, you know, I mean, it's great to have a reunion like this. I think, you know, when you've gone through this kind of thing with somebody, there's a bond uh, that uh, stays over all the years, you know, uh, no matter how many years guys are still connected. Well, I'll just, I appreciate it. I just wanted to say howdy, and uh, I know you've got something else you want to do. I can't wait to see it. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to share the screen uh, and start the documentary. Uh, hold on a minute. Uh, drive. Um... All right, let's go. Here we go. So here's the, uh, this is a really fabulous uh, documentary. Uh, it's very riveting and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, but I'll have it on the uh, website. You know, I make a YouTube of all these meetings. So if you have to go through the whole thing, you can check on YouTube. Okay, I'll, I'll send you all the link. Okay, enjoy. Masalama. A battered American ship pulled into the port of the letter. Let's start at the beginning. Okay. One summer morning in 1967, a battered American ship pulled into the port of Valletta. Six days earlier, on the 8th of June, the USS Liberty had been attacked. A torpedo had blown a huge hole in the ship's side, leaving her lower decks flooded. Everybody in the space that I worked in died, except me. Lost two was some of America's most sensitive electronic intelligence equipment. Because the Liberty was a spy ship. The Liberty should not have been here. It was no enemy that tried to sink the Liberty. It was America's ally, Israel then fighting its Arab neighbors in the Six-Day War.
The survivors have always said the attack was no accident. We were well known and the attack was obviously deliberate. I consider it uh, this cold-blooded murder of American sailors that day. Yet Israel insists it was a tragic case of mistaken identity. It's very embarrassing for, for a military force like the Israeli Defense Forces to make such a blunder, no doubt. But we admit our mistake. That does not mean that there was any intention or any conspiracy or anything of the sort. But the men of the Liberty claim there was a conspiracy and that it's been covered up for 35 years. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. site, the Wailing Wall, it's because the Six-Day War brought them control of Jerusalem's old city. It's also brought 35 years of violence, hatred, and bloodshed. Since 1967, Israel has become the dominant power in the Middle East, thanks to its alliance with the U.S. It was a turning point in our relationship with Israel. Up until that point, we had avoided being a major arms supplier to Israel. Paradoxically, uh, the security of Israel became one of our strategic objectives, which it had never been in the past. For 35 years, the Liberty veterans have been campaigning for justice and a full inquiry into the attack on their ship. We need you because it's what keeps us going. We can't do the things we want to do without your help. For many young men in mid-60s America, joining the Navy was a good alternative to army service. It was kind of funny. Um, I didn't want to go. It was uh, Vietnam. My friends were coming back in body bags, and uh, I put it off for a month. I got a second notice, and uh, I figured I'd better do something, and uh, I went and enlisted in the Navy, and um, um, went into the Navy, and uh, 13 weeks later after boot camp, I got into the USS Liberty. Rankowski didn't yet know it. But the liberty would also be on her way to war. While America was distracted by Vietnam, the Soviet Union was extending its influence in the Middle East. It backed radical governments in Syria and Egypt, whose president, Gamal Abdul Nasser, had become the Arab world's chief spokesman in its struggle with Israel. Egypt was under enormous pressure at the time, pressure by the, the Arab partners. Uh, uh, I remember the, the Jordanians calling uh, President Nasser and telling him, you are only bragging, you are not doing anything, you are letting down your Syrian allies and things like that. And uh, they saw it as a necessity to, to do something. To... Meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, the USS Liberty had crossed the Atlantic, put in at the West African port of Abidjan. Some of the sailors were on leave and busy with their home movie cameras. Liberty was an unarmed ship designed to listen in on electronic communications and pass intelligence on to the highest levels of the US government. There was no other ship like her. Her decks bristled with 45 antennas and below were dozens of communications analysts and translators. If it was broadcast on a radio wave, we could receive it at any frequency, low frequency, high frequency, medium frequency, very low frequency. It was out there, we could receive it. If we were listening and we, we heard a signal and when we looked at it, we couldn't understand it, it was encrypted as well. We'd send it back to NSA and let them hit it with their computers. NSA, the National Security Agency, is America's top secret organization for handling electronic intelligence. From its headquarters outside Washington, it controlled the Liberty as she cruised slowly along the west coast of Africa. In May 67, NASA moved thousands of Egyptian troops into the previously demilitarized Sinai Peninsula. Israel and Egypt now confronted each other head on. Though the saber rattling didn't mean war was inevitable. Then NASA raised the stakes. He closed the Straits of Tehran, cutting off the Israeli port of Elat. Israel saw this as an act of war and began to mobilize. In fact, Hawks and the Israeli government had been waiting for a showdown with the Arabs. Both sides now prepared for war. Soon to be caught up in this, was the USS Liberty. Her commander, William L. McGonagall, had been in the Navy since World War II. The crew included highly trained code breakers and radio experts, like Dave Lewis. I was the research officer on the research ship. Commanding officer drove the ship. The executive officer was his assistant. And I was in charge of the 195 security group personnel. We were sent around the world wherever there might be a hot spot to see if we could determine what was going on and if uh, the United States desired any intervention of any sort. Life aboard the USS Liberty was like no other naval life. And in the 1960s, ships of that ilk operated independently. The commanding officer of the USS America, which was the flagship of the Sixth Fleet, didn't keep track of a ship that was sailing um, all by itself. Um, when we were off duty, when the sailors were off duty, we went up topside and sunbathed. I mean, we wore pressed, starched, creased uniforms and spit shine shoes, and our fingernails were never dirty. I mean, we were slick. McGonagall, uh, he, was, he was a terrific person. We always, on Sunday, had a cookout on the fan of the ship. Being aboard the ship was really something. It was fun, like going from Abidjan, Ivory Coast, all the way down to Cape Town. You're drifting along at three knots and listening. 10 miles off the coast. When the Liberty pulled into Abidjan, that was a social event of the year. I got back aboard at 2 o'clock in the morning the day we left. <laughs> I was met at the gangway by Captain McGonagall, who informed me that we had orders to get underway immediately, and I was to get the rest of the troops, and we were getting underway. In a sudden change of mission, the ship was ordered to head for the Middle East.
5,000 miles away in Washington, Israel's hardline spymaster, Meir Amit, was making a secret visit to his friends in the CIA and the Pentagon. Amit's key meeting was with Robert McNamara, the US Secretary of Defense. Amit wanted to know whether the Americans would back Israel if it struck the first blow. But the two men have very different memories of their encounter. Yeah, I told him, look, we don't want even one soldier for you. All what we want from you to stop the Russian coming into the into the arena. And number two, to uh, help us after the war. So when I finished, he asked me two questions. One, how long it will take? I said one week. How many casualties? I told him less than the war of independence. So I asked him, uh, Mr. Secretary, what do you advise to me? Can, uh, can I go home now? Or stay here until things will clear up? He said, no, you go home, your place is there now. I drew the conclusion that it was a green light. Absolutely not. Because at that point, uh, President Johnson and I and Dean Rusk had fully agreed that we must keep the U.S. in a position where if Israel called on us for military assistance to turn back the attack by, by Egypt and possibly turn back an attack uh, by Egypt with the support of the Soviet Union, we had to be in a position that we could obtain the support of the American people and the Congress for applying military force in support of Israel. And we would not have that support if Israel had attacked Egypt. So our position was, no, don't initiate the attack. And I have no basis for believing that uh, the Israeli you spoke of received any other indication from me than that. That same night, a young NSA linguist named Alan Blue was suddenly dispatched to join the Liberty. He uh, was called in the middle of the night, around 2 o'clock in the morning. And he left the, left the house, he went to NSA, and at noon the next day, he was on a plane to Rota, Spain. I'd never seen him that way. He was almost teary. Um, he clung to me like he didn't when he had uh, taken um, prior trips. Alan Blue met the ship at the Spanish port of Rota. By now, the crew had been told they were heading for the Gaza Strip. We knew that from the daily news that the Arab-Israeli situation was getting more and more hostile. Uh, that so far, there was no war. Uh, but it looked to anybody who read the newspapers that there would soon be a war. And so we were sent out there, obviously, to listen to what was going on. Early on the morning of Monday, the 5th of June, Israel went to war. Its planes pounded airfields in Sinai and the Suez Canal Zone destroying most of Egypt's air force. These are the original shots taken by the gun cameras during the attacks on the Arab airfields. The fact is that they didn't have a clue when we came on. They were completely caught by surprise. They were having breakfast or meat after breakfast and coffee. A boof up we came on nine airfields, two in the Sinai, five in, in, in Egypt, and two in Upper Egypt. And then we were the second round and the third round and the fourth round. Once again, the actual aerial combat shots taken by the Israeli gun cameras. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was boosting its military presence near the war zone. It moved 20 warships into the eastern Mediterranean. In response, the Pentagon ordered the 6th Fleet to keep all aircraft and ships at least 100 miles away from the coast. But one vessel received no such message. 
the USS Liberty steamed on towards the Sinai coast. We were told there was no need to worry. We had asked Commander Sixth Fleet for uh, an armed guard to go along with us, a destroyer. He sent the message back saying we were in international waters, flying the American and there was no need for an armed escort. The Liberty was approaching a scene of total Israeli victory. On the third day of the war, they'd taken the West Bank. But the big prize was the capture of Jerusalem's old city. I was elated when I heard it. Jerusalem, every Jew prays, I think, every day next year in Jerusalem. That evening, the Liberty arrived at her destination off the Sinai coast. Thursday, the 8th of June, dawned fine and clear. But the war was still raging, and Israeli planes flew out from the Sinai Peninsula to check on the Liberty. Reveille was at six. Um, you got up, you showered and everything, and, and you go uh, for uh, a chow. But before that, we had heard that, like at five in the morning, or around that time, that the planes were buzzing us. The Israeli aircraft seemed to be identifying the ship as belonging to their ally, America. There were about nine different occasions that airplanes came out probably 12 times that were circled, 12 separate orbits of the, of the ship during the morning. Lloyd Painter relieved Ennis as officer of the deck. He too was reassured by the presence of the Israeli planes. I remember vividly looking out through the portals, looking down on the 01 level and seeing all the officers sunbathing. And at the same time, we were being overflown, and I remember feeling very good and very warm inside that we were safe. They knew who we were. We were not a stranger out there that day. Confident that the Israelis knew who they were, the Liberty men relaxed. A new flag was flying, visibility was perfect, and they'd received no orders to leave the area. That sense of security was about to be brutally shattered. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the officers on the bridge spotted three Delta Wing Mirage jets. I saw them come at us. In fact, I was looking through the porthole when the jets came down at, 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 and leveled off on us at attack attitude. To my surprise, uh, there were red flashes under the wings and uh, missiles, rockets started hitting the ship. But the portholes were blown out instantly. Mine and my chest, the fellow next to me uh, got it in his face. And we, we all went down on the deck with the force of the concussion from the uh, glass. The next thing I heard down in my space was a panicky announcement on the loudspeaker 1MC. General quarters, general quarters, this is no drill. General quarters, ship is under attack. And you hear ping, 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 ping. The decks above were being shredded. Attempts to send an SOS message failed. The Liberty's frequencies were being jammed. You'd have to know what frequencies we were going to come up on. Um, to know that, you'd have to know that we were an American ship. If you knew we were an American ship, you knew what frequencies we were going to be on because you knew what the fleet frequencies were. Duh. Hello. The attackers knew their target but they were keeping their own identity well hidden. During the attack, uh, no one saw any markings, and some of the men uh, told me later that they made a special effort to identify them, and they swear that there were no markings, that these airplanes were unmarked. They took out all of our transmitting antennas, and shortly thereafter deposited napalm on the deck. It appeared to me that it was the intent of the attacker to take out all communications and keep all people off deck so they couldn't reestablish any sort of antennas or communication system. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. The only reason we got the SOS out 
because my crazy troops were climbing the antenna string and long wires while they were being shot at. At the end of the air attack, eight men were dead and 75 injured. But the worst was yet to come. We immediately uh, cast off our lines and rushed out. I at least didn't know why. The sea was very calm and then a uh, bright day. I think it was around midday or maybe a little before that, but around midday. Uh, and only on, on the way we were told there was uh, a uh, unknown vessel uh, to the south of us or southwest uh, of us. And uh, we sped over, over in that direction. Very soon we did see a ship, a, clearly a naval vessel. The last thing I remember is the captain on the intercom system saying, stand by for a torpedo attack, starboard side. Down below the waterline, the men in the engine room got ready to die. Torpedoes coming in, it's going to open that boiler up, and you're going to die instantly. It's going to be like an atomic bomb, because that cold water, when that cold water hits that boiler, that's operating at full, uh, there's just no hope. So... All of us 19-year-olds, the best place to be is right there. You're going to get it. You're going to give it up right then and there. So Torpedo, that we waited, and they said it went by. And this went on like three different times, four different times. The torpedo is simply dropped into the water. You lose sight of it for a minute. And then you see the wake. And it was going straight for the ship, and we were sure that uh, our torpedo was the one that hit. It hit. And it lifted the ship right out of the water and put it down, and we started to list 10 degrees. Um, but it was a slow list, and it was going, going, going. And I said, my God, we're going to flip over. I was one of the fortunate ones. A temporary bulkhead wrapped itself around me, and the heat of the torpedo exploded all of the paint onto my skin. So I was black, but it was all superficial. Lost both eardrums, got my eyes burnt a little, but I survived. And almost all of the troops within 20 feet of me were killed instantly. We uh, we just went back to work and uh, prayed that uh, this thing was not going to flip over or if it was going to go down, and, uh, and, and it didn't. That's about it for now. The Liberty was now paralyzed, her power and steering control lost. But her desperate SOS message had been picked up by the American 6th Fleet, 500 miles away off Crete. Retaliation was ordered for the attack. On the USS America, two bombers were readied while their fighter escort was launched. Those aircraft were, were brought forward and I believe they were launched before we went into Condition November. Condition November meant that nuclear-armed A-4 bombers were to be used. Incredibly, the U.S. was about to launch a nuclear strike against Egypt, the Liberty's presumed attacker. Uh, one of them was taxied forward to Cat 1, and it was uh, it had a, like a shroud uh, around the underside of the fuselage, uh, and, and it had Marine guards. Uh, escorting the uh, BA-4. So uh, that was a very unusual um, uh, experience. I've never seen anything like that. There was a flash message, as I recall, from one of the carriers that said they had launched ready aircraft. The launching of ready aircraft, you understand, that is typically nuclear-armed aircraft. Cairo was about to be incinerated. The U.S. Embassy was told that an attack was coming. Richard Parker was the political consul. There was this message that they, the Navy was uh, preparing to retaliate against Egypt for the attack on the Liberty. Uh, they thought that it was the, the, the Egyptians who attacked it. They were preparing to, uh, to attack Egypt in response. A few minutes later, Tony Hart passed a Pentagon message through to the Navy. Recalled the aircraft. My, my first thought was, as well, we don't want to do mushroom clouds. 
the recall probably is to rearm the aircraft. About 10 minutes later, the USS America and Washington were connected by voice link. The defense secretary himself came on the line. McNamara directed Com 6 Fleet to recall the aircraft. And Com 6 Fleet said, are you sure? And he said, absolutely certain, recall the aircraft. The attack on the Liberty had triggered an extraordinary response. Nuclear armed planes had been on their way to Cairo. A nuclear strike had been minutes away and had only just been averted. But it seems McNamara was also unwilling to send aircraft directly to help the Liberty. The fleet commander asked for permission to send a rescue flight of conventionally armed aircraft. The Admiral was talking to McNamara and asking for permission to relaunch the ready aircraft, relaunch any aircraft. And McNamara said no, that no aircraft were to be launched. Uh, McNamara is the boss, you know, he doesn't have to explain why he says what he says. Dave Lewis heard from another officer about McNamara's dealings with the 6th Fleet. I'm Admiral Larry Geis, the commander of Task Force 60. He was very upset. He said, told me he knew it was going to be hushed up, and I wasn't to say anything about it, but he had to get it off his chest. That he had sent aircraft and notified Washington, obviously via the Criticom network, because it got to Bob McNamara and Lyndon Johnson, and he got, had the aircraft recalled by Robert McNamara. So he said he reconfigured a flight of aircraft with aircraft incapable of carrying nuclear weaponry and relaunched it. He again notified Washington. Again, Robert McNamara ordered the aircraft recalled. He challenged the order and Lyndon Johnson came on. He said he didn't give a damn if the ship sunk. He would not embarrass his allies. Robert McNamara has never fully discussed his role in the Liberty controversy. You recalled planes sent to rescue the Liberty. I am plane. absolutely certain that's false. You didn't send a signal to the six Absolutely fleet? not. I don't know what the hell happened, and I haven't taken time to find out. But there are all of these claims that we sent planes, the planes were going out and we turned them around, and that we intentionally allowed the Israelis to sink the Liberty. I, I know nothing about it. While the 6th Fleet was launching and recalling its aircraft, the Liberty was still under attack by the Israeli torpedo boats. You can see these uh, machine gun bullets going through and, and uh, ricocheting off all the metal that was down there. And uh, actually, some were going into the boiler. They're trying to explode the boiler, and uh, they, they knew what they were doing. We basically were dead in the water. The word came down, prepare to abandon ship. That meant prepare only, go up and get get ready, get near the life rafts. Well, I went up first, popped the hatch, looked out for the life rafts. They were either gone or burning. And at the same moment, I looked to the stern of the ship and I saw one of the torpedo boats methodically machine gunning one of our life rafts that had floated back. We cut the life rafts loose because they were burning or had, had been damaged. And they floated back behind us and he was machine gunning the life raft. And I knew that had there been anyone in there, they certainly wouldn't be alive. It happened so fast, it didn't seem real. None of the attacks seemed real to me. I was bewildered. I couldn't understand why they would do it to us. I, I just didn't understand the thing at that point. These guys didn't die for anything. They just died. They were slaughtered for nothing. The assault was over, but the cover-up was about to begin. At four o'clock, the American naval attaché in Tel Aviv heard from the defense ministry that a ship had been attacked in error. The American embassy immediately reported back to the State Department in Washington. I was the first one that got the word. And uh, I, my immediate reaction was it could not have been an accident. Shortly before 10 in the morning, Washington time, the news was passed on to President Johnson. 
was rather inclined to agree with my view was that it had to have been uh, an intended attack. Johnson's belief that the attack was deliberate is preserved in the minutes of a White House meeting the following day. Also present was the CIA director, Richard Helms. And I know that uh, for the first 24 hours, the president was furious that uh, something like this had gone on. Whatever Johnson's inner circle thought privately, officially they accepted Israel's apologies and its explanation. Everybody seemed to be a little appalled at the Israelis. But this was not reflected in the public positions East, that the collective group had uh, outside that room. And I think we were overprotective of the Israelis at that point. I think the feeling was that uh, the pressure, political pressure, would be too much. And they were just going to let it go. That in front of me would just go away. As a matter of fact, he said to me, standing in the cabinet room one day, have you looked at the New York Times? The attack on that American ship is on page 29, when it should have been on the front page. And then I guess various people got at him and so forth, and he changed his mind. But uh, or I don't think he changed his mind. He just changed his actions. President Johnson's public stance allowed Israel also to cover up the attack. Israel has always maintained that it was a series of mistakes. None of the former fighter pilots would agree to speak, but one of the torpedo boat sailors gave us his account. Uh, we were inexperienced at the time. We were uh, probably uh, a little trigger happy, and it was a war zone. Uh, no one should have been there, and anybody who is there is doing it at his own risk. Israel admits the reconnaissance planes had identified the Liberty during the morning. The Air Force notified Naval HQ in Haifa, where the ship's position was marked on a combat information map. Later that morning, Navy HQ received reports of the Sinai coast being shelled from the sea. But by this time, say the Israelis, the Liberty had been erased from their naval map. When the patrol boats went to find the source of the alleged shelling, the only ship they found there was the Liberty. Then the patrol boats misread the mystery ship's speed on their radar. They thought it was making 28 knots, so it could only be an enemy warship. The way you do it is by taking the uh, direction and distance from the radar to the, the target on the radar screen. And uh, if you do it for a short period, for just several minutes, the differences in the speed can be fantastic. Anything between uh, uh, going backwards and, and, and 30 knots forward. So that's a very normal mistake. And so the Air Force was summoned to catch the fast-moving target. Then, says Israel, the sailors made another fatal mistake, confusing the ship with the El Kuzair, an Egyptian transport vessel half the Liberty's size. It looked very similar to, to the Alcacer. There were some differences. And again, you have to remember that she was already, she had already been fired upon by the, uh, by the airplanes. This was when word of the attack first reached the head of the Navy, who happened to be Udi Arel's father. He'd been at Haifa Harbor out of radio contact and had just got back to Navy HQ. Of course I was furious. The minute she was torpedoed, and it was clear to me, actually, that she, was, she couldn't have made 28 knots. Uh, so I actually immediately ordered uh, definite identification. And then they reported that the flag was going up, was being hoisted. And uh, then his first identification was Soviet. I said, oh, my God. Come closer, I came closer and he identified her as an American ship. Whatever the ship's identity, the Israelis vehemently deny that they'd ever fire at life rafts in the water. I don't believe it. I never saw such a thing. Uh, there was nothing that was even resembling a life raft. Uh, and, and we certainly didn't shoot at it. 
we are taking part of the blame, but only part of the blame. We made most of the mistakes. They made many mistakes on the spot. And by the fact that the, that the, the liberty should not have been there. But the evidence points to Israel knowing the ship's identity and wanting it sunk fast. This U.S. Air Force intelligence analyst was following radio intercepts of the attack. The communications I had in my hands originated from a, an Israeli flight commander. Evidently, from, from his questioning to the ground control, it's, one can deduce that he had given, been given specific orders to attack that ship before he left the ground. And when he saw it was an American ship, he questioned those orders. And he questioned those orders to his ground control. That same conversation that, that I had in my hands specifically noted that the ground control said, proceed with the attack. And there was still doubt in the Israeli pilot's mind. And he said, no, this is American. Repeat those orders again. And he was told flat out, do attack this ship. That night was a very long night. I'm thinking at that point, I hope we don't sink, because I knew the extent of the damage. I'd been down and taken a look at it, and I knew that we were in bad, bad shape. We had a lot of, uh, of dead folks, a lot of gravely wounded folks on that ship, including the captain, who toward the end of the, of the, of the shift, toward the end of the 15 hours, had regained consciousness and was sitting up in his chair, and, but not saying much, just sat. Help was finally on its way. Ships from the Sixth Fleet were steaming towards the Liberty and would reach her the next morning. It was quite a sight uh, to see so much of a flotilla there, the carriers. We, did, we looked and we said, God, what a flotilla. Where the hell were you? Where, why didn't you come? I mean, everybody aboard the ship said the same thing. The Liberty was now heading to Malta for emergency repairs. An important visitor was helicoptered aboard. Admiral Isaac Kidd was leading a naval inquiry into the attack. His behavior surprised the sailors. I thought he was a very strange person because he took his stars off and, and walked around, tried to walk around like a, a regular guy. You know, everybody knew who he was. But I thought that was rather strange. I, I, I didn't buy into that one real easy. He took his... Uh his eagles off and he says well guys he says you just pretend that uh i'm one of you guys now tell me uh tell me all about it so they told what they see in that and after a while he put his pins back on and he says uh, i don't want you guys talking about this at all to anybody your shipmates don't uh don't be given any interviews here uh while we're in malta he says anything that has to be uh told through your uh division officer through your captain don't be uh talking to your family about i mean he was very specific by this time all the injured men had been taken aboard the rescue ships remember being hauled up into that helicopter in a basket that had been wrapped tightly around me from head to toe. The corpsman, not knowing which end was up, sat on my head all the way back. And all I could think of was what an ignominious way to die after having survived a torpedo attack. They took the wounded and the dead off and took them to the USS America, where we were then taken into their hospital area. That was when the Navy and the might of the United States Navy was really with us. Up until then, it hadn't been.
an unarmed American ship had been attacked by Israeli planes and boats. 34 sailors were dead, and the U.S. had done nothing to help. For the first time in 35 years, we can explain why. The theories cast light on the tangled web of American-Israeli relations. Some people suspect the ship might have been overhearing information on Israeli operations in the Sinai. I think they intended to attack the ship. Exactly why they wanted to, I'm not sure. They may have felt we were, uh, with, that, with the liberty, we were listening into some conversations and other things that were going on that they didn't want us to know about. And uh, they, they had been engaged in some pretty outlandish stuff in the course of the war. And I didn't think they wanted us to know all the detail of that. I don't think that we would have cared. America was not an enemy. There was nothing they could uh, in any way involve us, threaten us, concern us. I don't even know what were the tasks of the liberty. What really, what the purpose to find out where, how the war was going on? I don't know. But there's a broader theory that the attack was intended to be blamed on Egypt and would therefore draw America into the war and was carried out with the foreknowledge of certain people in Washington. The Liberty's captain had always suspected this was the case. In 1997, at Arlington Cemetery, he broke his 30-year silence. For many years, I had wanted to believe that the attack on the Liberty was pure error. It appears to me that it was not a pure case of mistaken identity. I think that it's about time that the state of Israel and the United States government provide the crew members of the Liberty and the rest of the American people the facts of what happened and why it came about that the Liberty was attacked 30 years ago today. Less than two years later, McGonagall himself would be buried at Arlington. Shortly before he died, he sent an open letter to President Clinton calling for Israel to acknowledge publicly that her armed forces had deliberately attacked the USS Liberty. Captain McGonagall was more than just a captain in the Navy. He was a friend. He was a sailor's captain. Towards the end of his life, McGonagall confided in his old friend, the chief engineer. Captain and I was, was, was real close. And um, every time I'd see him while he was in the hospital, uh, he would cry. And, and uh, he called me a few years two or three years before he died, uh, he was going to be in Washington for me to come up there. And I sat in a room with him, we chatted a while, and then he got started telling me that those SOBs really did us in. George said, so what are you talking about? McGonagall went on to say that if the Liberty had been sunk with all hands, the blame would naturally fall on Egypt and her Soviet backer. We were guinea pigs to be sunk, and then we could say Egypt and Russia did it. That way the United States could have stepped right in and helped Israel. We found evidence that this was part of a larger plan hatched by Israeli and American intelligence to invade Egypt and overthrow NASA, a plan codenamed Cyanide. A key figure was James Angleton, Israel's closest friend in the CIA, and unique beneficiary of a memorial from Mossad. Jim Ennis first came across cyanide almost by chance. I had gone to the LBJ library asking for you know, all liberty documents, and this 
one page paper came out of nowhere minutes from the 303 committee the 303 committee was a secret group that used to meet at the old executive office building around the corner from the white house 303 committee was simply a device for examining covert operations of any kind and making a judgment on behalf of the president so he wouldn't be nailed with the thing if it failed. Here in April 1967, the committee met to discuss a sensitive defense department project. It would involve the liberty with a highly risky submarine operation to help Israel. Scribbled on the minutes is a note, submarine within UAR waters, another term for Egypt. Especially the fact that this was in the Liberty file uh, suggested that this had to do with uh, with the submarine that was near us and uh, with cyanide and all the other things. Dave Lewis had also heard about cyanide. One of his officers had told him the ship was carrying secret documents in connection with a submarine project. He said there are sealed orders in my safe for Project Cyanide that involves communication via submarine in case of war. That's all I know about it. The orders were never open. The attack took place. There wasn't time. So I don't know what they said. What connection could this mysterious submarine have had with the Liberty? And why was it being discussed a full two months in advance of the war? The operation is still so sensitive that we could get no comment from U.S. or Israeli intelligence. Operation Sinai. If I heard about it, if I heard so. What was it? Um, I suggest we stop the interview here. What do you say? What I wanted. Why would you not be able to speak about Operation Sinai? It's 34 years since. <clears throat> Signature and loyalty to my country. Is it very sensitive? I am being so, and I know exactly what I am able to tell you, and I know exactly where I stop, and here I stop. Operation Sinai was a joint Israeli-American venture using submarines and other covert type uh, 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 intelligence gathering efforts uh, against the UAR. But that has a logical explanation. The explanation is the UAR uh, was uh, totally Soviet equipped. They had Soviet advisors. So the Soviet Union was our arch enemy at the time, and we were concerned in a volatile Mideast situation with the Soviet problem. We were concerned wherever the Soviets showed uh, showed up, and is and they had considerable influence in the United Arab Republic. So there were these uh, uh, joint ventures with Israeli intelligence. We were strategic and tactical reconnaissance photo processing specialists. We flew probably eight missions that day, all bomb damage assessment, all airports in disarray, lines of aircraft destroyed in place. From what we saw in that film, it was unchallengeable um, destruction of the enemy. This covert operation was also part of cyanide. Before the war, the team had secretly been sent to an Israeli air base in the Negev desert. The men wore unmarked uniforms and had no ID, while four American reconnaissance planes were disguised as Israeli. There was a hurry-up paint job uh, done to the aircraft to identify them as Israeli aircraft so that, that they would be in conformance with normal Israeli uh, normal Israeli markings. No, not one single word of it is true. I don't know what, is the man, I don't know, 
fantasy, it's a fantasy, he's dreaming, he's making it up, nothing. Um, they can deny it now, fine. Take a look at the reconnaissance information that the Israelis have that was published publicly in Time magazine, Life magazine, I think Look magazine, that was our work. The Israelis had no reconnaissance aircraft and you can't get the detail off of gun cameras that, that was in those films. If it's true that America was secretly in the war against Egypt, this had to be kept quiet at all costs. Well, the implication would be very serious. I mean, first of all, it means that, that, that LBJ and his uh, people around him had been lying to us uh, through their teeth. Uh, and that may be a minor matter for most people, but it'd be important to us. Uh, but more important, it would mean a, a, uh, uh, an American uh, participation in the attack on, on uh, Egypt, a very serious thing for us to have done. And it would have, uh, you know, uh, we finished our relations with the with the Arab world for a long time to come. As it was, six Arab states broke relations with us. Whatever lies behind the attack. The human tragedy was that 34 young men were dead. Most were killed below decks, and their remains could only be removed when the Liberty finally arrived at Malta. By then, the bodies of five others had drifted out of the hole. Only when the dock was drained did the full horror of the destruction become apparent. I remember taking that photograph and I remember seeing parts of bodies in, in the cables and wiring that were jammed uh, around, it, especially in the top part. It seemed like on the overhead, a lot of parts of bodies were hanging there. It looked like a meat locker. Uh, we had to go down and start cleaning that up. One of the men killed was Alan Blue, the NSA linguist so suddenly sent abroad. His wife didn't even know he was on the USS Liberty. I was sitting in a park in uh, Washington, D.C., having my lunch about one o'clock in the afternoon on June 8. It was a beautiful, clear, sunny day. And um, about 15, 20 feet away from me, someone had a radio. Administration handling of the June Arab-Israeli war crisis. And I overheard this report on their radio that an American ship had been uh, attacked in the Mediterranean. And my heart sank, even though I did not know he was on that ship, I was still very frightened. I picked up my lunch, I went inside to my office, I called um, NSA and they said, yes, we've been looking for you. Alan Blue was later buried at Arlington National Cemetery. For the previous month, his widow had had to share her house with minders from the NSA. They told her nothing and controlled her contact with the outside world. I think they were anxious to not have um, any press um, around us at that time. No one from the NSA uh, ever contacted me to explain what happened. There were many, many people at the service. I'm not sure who they all were. In Malta, meanwhile, the Liberty men were alarmed by the way Admiral Kidd was steering the naval inquiry. He seemed to have made up his mind in advance and was ignoring crucial evidence. I testified about three major items that I had witnessed. One was the captain's condition. I also testified about the armor-piercing projectiles that had been set through our ship. And I also testified about the uh, machine gunning of the life rafts by the Israeli torpedo boats. I testified, uh, like I said, for about two and a half, three hours. I didn't know until, I don't remember, months later, that the much of my testimony was never recorded. McGonagall had blacked out during the attack, so the chief engineer took command of the ship. 
Yet the inquiry wasn't interested in what he had to say. I got so peeved off I couldn't see straight. Uh, before it broke up, I stood outside the door and wanted to go in there so that I could get my say in those many minutes that were being taken. But he wanted to keep me out of that almost completely. The report was reviewed at the Navy's European headquarters by Merlin Starring, later the Navy's top lawyer. It didn't appear to support Kidd's conclusion that Israel had attacked in error. Well, I, I simply could not find an evidentiary basis for that conclusion. I had considerable trouble with the record in attempting to, as I read through it, uh, attempting to find the evidence, the testimony, and our other evidence that would support some of the findings or opinions or conclusions that the Court of Inquiry had, uh, had drafted and had reached. Today, even after 35 years, the Liberty incident remains so sensitive that the U.S. Navy refuses to comment on it. I think there was a, a cover-up. I think there were details known from talking with some of those crew. It was pretty bad. How can my personal view be other than my American view, which was that uh, they intended to attack the ship and that no excuse can be found for their saying that this was just a mistake? Most importantly, President Johnson like Richard Helms, would also have been getting the radio intercepts. It's like a cable or a, a telex, right, that was sent to all the intelligence agencies and to the White House at the same time because it was an American ship being attacked by a friendly power. Anything that's inimical and dangerous to the, to the, to the United States that the president has to see on a near real-time basis, he has to receive it. Did Johnson order a cover-up. No, that I'm aware of. But people were sworn to secrecy. The naval inquiry is regarded by many as incomplete. You ask Magnum about those questions, I'm not going to answer those. I am not saying anything about the liberty, period. In Israel, it was soon business as usual. An inquiry attended by the Navy chief, Shlomo Arel, concluded that the attack was mainly due to a series of Israeli blunders. Despite this, nobody was charged or court-martialed. They didn't find anyone guilty of uh, um, committing any, any crime or negligence or whatever. But this is... I don't want to... Uh, to make apologies for that because it was outside my jurisdiction. After a month in Malta, the Liberty was patched up and ready to begin her journey home. It was pretty eerie because... Uh, we had to stand watches um, different uh, times down where the torpedo had hit. We had to check for leaks, and you could smell the fuel oil, and it was so airy. You... Blanchard, seaman. Alan Blue, civilian. Jerry Conver. Sorry, I <laughs> Sorry, I skipped it by accident. Let me get you back. You know, your shipmates were just down there and you'd swear that they were talking to you.
arrived uh, to fanfare to uh, local press and uh, Miss Norfolk, Miss Hospitality, Miss everybody. Anyway, they got us in and got us tied up and uh, all inside was nothing but just shell of the ship. Nothing was left. One of the things that, that bothered me for years was coming home. I'd survived all that other stuff, but the coming home part and facing people who had lost their loved ones, that was very difficult, very, very difficult. The men had been ordered never to talk about the attack and the threat of court martial. Now the Navy scattered them, and no two were posted together. Even their medals were awarded secretively. I remember receiving my, my uh, Purple Heart in the captain's office in Bremerhaven, Germany, and with the ad, with the with a warning: don't ever tell anyone where you got it. Don't ever. I knew at that time that things had gone terribly wrong with with what had happened to us. I knew something was up, and, and so I basically made a decision to get out of the Navy, and I, and I uh, did my uh, finished off my obligation, resigned my commission and left the Navy. Captain McGonagall was given the merit's highest award, but with little ceremony. That's the only Congressional Medal of Honor that I'm familiar with that was not presented by the President of the United States. It's normal protocol for the President to present the CMH. It was presented by the Secretary of the Navy at the Navy Yard, a little base down in Southeast Washington rather than at the White House by the president? Well, certainly, uh, I think it was a, the, the way that the, the Navy and the White House handled this was a travesty. Uh, Johnson didn't want this thing publicized. Uh, he thought it would uh, uh, you know, harm relations with Israel and his relations with, uh, with Jews in the United States. More liberty, as you were commanding officer at that time. For the officers and men of liberty, I accept this presidential unit citation, and I would add my own personal appreciation for their professional devotion to duty. Every one of our citations talks about military action, occasionally mentions enemy action, but never mentions that it was the state of Israel. For heroic achievement. In connection with the unprovoked and unexpected armed attack on USS Liberty in the Eastern Mediterranean on 8th of June 1967. A Silver Star Medal to Lieutenant George H. Calder. Three times when told to stand by for torpedo attack. I witnessed a cover up take place of the highest magnitude. I witnessed someone receiving the highest medal of the land, someone being promoted, someone given his choice of duty in the Navy for his silence. Nothing more, nothing less. And the, the silence paid off. The captain never stepped forward until the end of his life. And I only think what could have been if he'd have stepped forward in 1967. But a presidential election was coming up. Nobody in power wanted to let questions about the USS Liberty spoil relations with victorious Israel. I think it should have caused more of a problem than it did. It was, we went on in, in official reactions to each other and we renewed our old friendships, considered we really ignored it for all practical purposes. And we shouldn't have. It was a very bad thing. to win a war quickly, there will be more mistakes, unfortunately. But that's the result of those mistakes is that you have won the war in six days. So this is the price you have to pay. Unfortunately, the price in this case, one of the prices, was the liberty ship. Israel today still occupies the conquered Palestinian territories, thanks to continued U.S. support. The war of only six days has left a painful legacy of suspicion, suffering, and sorrow.
Among those living with that legacy are the Liberty survivors, bitter about their own government's cover-up. Jim Ennis spent years trying to find out what had really happened. This book will be with me as long as I'm here. I've often said I'd like to have seen it go away years ago. I would have hoped that my book would have generated a congressional investigation that would have answered the remaining questions and the whole thing could have been put to rest and there'd be no question about what happened and why and uh, we just put it on we all go on to other things. Jerry Gross, Petty Officer. Melvin Smith, Chief Petty Officer. Carl Noah, Seaman. John Spicer, Petty Officer. Gary Blanchard, Seaman. Alan Blue, Civilian. Jerry Converse, Petty Officer. There's 34 guys that can't talk. And uh, there's 34 families that need some answers. And there's uh, the rest of the crew that needs some answers too. I really don't have any malice against the guys who pulled the triggers because they were the guys that were given orders, do it, because if you don't do it, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. I would like to meet those guys and see what they had to say to me. People gave the orders. They got away with murder. The BBC Four Zone returns to BBC Two next Tuesday with a profile. Well, that's certainly very helpful. Um, um, I uh, thank all of you who. Uh, have kept watching uh, people on Facebook, uh, Kamal and Kahali, Eugene, uh, Muhammad, um, Nawal, and some of these names in Arabic that I can't read. Uh, I think it begins with an F. I don't know. Anyhow. Um, so uh, thank you for uh, hanging in to discuss this really very serious issue. And I think we're going to have some further uh, sessions on it uh, because um, as the two survivors of uh, uh, Robert Kassam's cousin and Ron, uh, Reverend uh, Ron Kukal said the time has come now that he thinks that, that um, we have a better chance now than before uh, to have this um, brought to light. So thank you very much and uh, I wish you all a wonderful week. Thank you for being seen next Sunday. Masalama. Mm -hmm.